Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Lancaster and Burks, Burks Epilepsy Education Exchange. We are so happy to have you join us this evening. I'm Missy Dalloway. I am the president and CEO of the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania. And um, while we are disappointed we can't be together in person this evening, um, we're thrilled to be able to have you join us via webinar. Um, we have a really wonderful program planned for you, um, some really wonderful speakers, and um, we hope you learn a lot. We hope you get a lot out of this, and um, we're just really grateful that you were able to join us. So just so you know, um, your audio and video will be muted during our webinar this evening. Um, so, you know, you can feel free to relax and, and grab a pen and paper and take some notes. Um, if you do have any questions as the presentations are going on, please feel free to enter them right into your chat box, the question and answer box below. Um, you won't be interrupting the presentation at all. And um, at the conclusion of each presentation, uh, we'll take some time for questions and answers um, as long as time is permitting. I wanted to take a moment to give a special thanks to our conference series sponsors, Greenwich Biosciences, UCB, ASI, and Synovian, as well as our vendor sponsors, SK Life Science, Supernus, Pharmaceuticals, and Herbology. Um, so normally during our conferences, we have time to go around and meet our sponsors and ask any questions that we have. Um, since we are not able to be together in person, I will be sending out um, a detailed sponsor information e email after this um, in case you'd like to connect with any of your local representatives and ask questions and get more information. But wanted to give them um, a huge thank you because they are um, who makes these educational conferences happen every year um, and we're, we're truly grateful for their support. So epilepsy. You are not alone. Um, you're not alone because the Epilepsy Foundation is here to, to serve and support you, um, but you're not alone because this is really not a rare disorder. Um, epilepsy is a disorder that affects one in 26 people, um, 3.4 million Americans, and 110,000 people right here in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, so, you know, while it might sometimes be regarded as a rare disorder, this is a lot more common than it seems. A big part of that is because it really can be this hidden silent disorder that um, people don't need to talk about unless, you know, they might have a seizure in the workplace or at school. Um, but that's why we're here to, to encourage you to share your story, talk about your epilepsy, help us raise that awareness. Um, because, you know, the more that we can raise awareness and spread education, that's how we can really make strides um, in helping our epilepsy community. So the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania, um, our headquarter office is right in Center City, Philadelphia, um, but we serve the 18 counties of Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, our focus is on education, support, advocacy, um, and really building that community to, of hope and education and support. Um, we are here for you as we have been for the last, for over 45 years. Um, and our mission is right here on the screen to stop seizures and SUDEP find a cure and overcome the challenges created by epilepsy through efforts including education, advocacy, and research to accelerate ideas into therapies. We have a wide range of, whoops, my screen just went blank and I, <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, I'm still with you all. Um, Okay, I think someone will let me know if I'm not. <laughs> You're good, Missy. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Always a hiccup along the way with these webinars, but uh, we're doing our best. Um, so right here on our screen, um, we do have a very wide range of free programs, support services, and resources that are available to you. Um, we offer Project School Alert, where our resource coordinators go into our schools to train um, teachers and nurses and students on seizure recognition and first aid. We do similar trainings um, with businesses, uh, first responders and law enforcement. Um, we offer monthly support group meetings all throughout our region, um, advocacy efforts. Um, we offer some retreat programs such as Camp Achieve, which is our week-long sleepaway camp for children 8 to 17 living with epilepsy. 
Um, we do a young, a young adult retreat weekend as well as our first adult wellness weekend um, this fall. Um, so, you know, really a, a great range of programs and services that are here for you. They're, they're available to you and um, any way that we can get you more connected and involved, we would love to do that. How can you be involved? So some of the ways I mentioned on that previous screen, um, I, I think great ways to get involved is uh, trying out one of our support groups, which we're offering virtually right now. Um, almost all of our programs and services we are offering virtually. Um, we have taken these educational conferences into webinar formats. We're offering our walk to end epilepsies as um, virtual walk events. Um, you know, you can always raise awareness on your own as a grassroots effort. Um, any way that you'd like to be involved, we'd love to have you more connected. So I encourage you to reach out to your uh, local resource coordinator, Carrie Micnia, um, after this, and, and we can get you involved as you'd like to be. Speaking of those walked in epilepsy events going virtual, um, we have our two June walked in epilepsy events um, in the Lehigh Valley in Philadelphia, which we have combined into a week long virtual walk event. So on Sunday, June 14th, which was the date of the Lehigh Valley Walk, we will be hosting a virtual opening ceremony where we will um, kind of give instructions for the week and recognize our partners and um, detail some of the different challenges and incentives we're gonna be ha having during the week. That week will be your time to complete the walk, take pictures of you and your family walking your neighborhood decked out in purple, share those on social media. Um, and then on Saturday, June 20th, the date of the Philadelphia walk, we'll be hosting a virtual closing ceremony where we'll um, be sharing photos and videos from the week, um, sharing top fundraisers, um, it should be a really fun uh, community building event that we can do together um, during these times while we're apart. Um, you can register at epilepsywalklv.org. And um, at, that, at this point, I would love to introduce um, your resource coordinator, Carrie McNia. I'm sure you all know well. And she will be speaking about uh, the next walk that won't be virtual, hopefully. And um, I will... Uh, leave it to her to take it away. Okay, good evening, everybody. Sorry for the hiccup. We are learning as we go here. I hope that you can all hear me. Um, I wanted to say good evening and thank you for joining us for this. Um, it's a little bit different of a format, but we are so glad that you're here with us. And um, my name is Carrie Mikna, as Missy said, and I'm the Lancaster and Berks uh, coordinator for the region. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, we are talking about walks and our next uh, after Lehigh Valley and Philadelphia is the Lancaster Walk. We had a really great walk last year and we're hoping to repeat that this year. Um, the date is, so you can mark your calendar, is Saturday, October 17th from 9 a.m. or it starts at 9 a.m. Um, so come register. And we, we know that Saturday, October 17th seems like a long way off right now. Um, but we're letting you know because you can start forming those teams now and get everybody's spirits up and excited. Um, it should be a great event. It will be at Clipper Magazine Stadium once again. And as Missy said, um, $35 gets you your t-shirt. 
and um, the memories you'll make that day um, will be outstanding. Um, we, I wanted to tell you um, about some other programs that we have going on too. Um, through this challenging time, we've started um, really ramping up our online learning. Um, and so we provide seizure recognition and first aid training online. Um, we have a couple coming up, as you can see, epilepsy in school, training for teachers and school personnel. That's um, a webinar on Friday, May 29th. Uh, in the afternoon. Then we have a seizure recognition in adults and children, which should be a good one. That's Friday, June 5th. And then we have epilepsy in school training for nurses specifically, which is Wednesday, June 10th at 3.30. So if you're interested in any of those, just go onto our website, um, down there, EFEPA at EFEPA.org. And um, I'm sorry, uh, that's our email. You can email us and we'll give you more information. And keep in mind that we can also provide training to first responders um, like law enforcement and EMTs. Um, we are happy to set any kind of training up that fits your schedule. So just let us know what you need. This is a tentative um, schedule for tonight's conference. Um, so as you can see, we're just moving right along here. And that brings me to our first speaker which we're so excited to have Sally Schaefer. She's with the Epilepsy Foundation um, at the SUDEP Institute, and she will be presenting on SUDEP, Knowledge is Power. Uh, so, Sally is the Senior Director of the Epilepsy Foundation SUDEP Institute, a program within the Epilepsy Foundation. The SUDEP Institute brings awareness and education around SUDEP, Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. The, pro the program also supports research to end SUDEP and also assist the bereaved. Sally has a degree in healthcare administration and spent most of her career in corporate healthcare. Since taking this role in 2018, she has traveled the country educating others to know more about SUDEP and death in epilepsy. She inspires those living with epilepsy to know more to help them drive conversations with their physicians to minimize their risk of SUDEP. Sally takes her personal passion into this professional role and finds solace in helping others, showing the world that she can make a difference for others living with epilepsy. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, start sharing. So just one moment here, so I can bring up my presentation. I have a little pop-up box that keeps coming up. My apologies. All right, can you all see that screen well? Is everybody, can you all see it? Yes. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Thank you, also I hope you can hear me okay. Um, it's um, very common for me to be doing a, a webinar or a Zoom or something like this, but I know that it's not common for you. Usually you're in person, but thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm overjoyed to be here again. Um, just love EFPA. They are always reaching out for more information and to really educate um, those people in their community about so much. So I am honored and so thankful to be here. Again, I am Sally Schaefer. I am the director of the SUDEP Institute, Sudden Unexpected Death and Epilepsy. As you saw from my short bio, I've been with the um, SUDEP Institute since January of 2018. And I wanna come today to share more information about the SUDEP Institute. But um, is it possible, is everyone on mute for the call? I, I'm just trying to gauge the uh, background here. Is everybody on mute? Sally, everybody is on mute. Okay. Um, so I wish I would have had a polling, would have helped me a little bit, but I'm wondering, I'm hoping that most of you have heard of SIDS, sudden um, infant death. Um, I think if you have a child, you go into your pediatrician and they immediately share, make sure you lay your baby on its back. You've probably seen national campaigns over the years. Um, something that was common, very commonly, you know, we know as parents, when we have someone that we give birth to that, hey, make sure you take care of that baby, don't lay it face down. Um, 
And you probably know that there's been many people affected by cancer. You probably have someone in your life that's been affected by cancer close to you. Cancer is very well known. Unfortunately, we're in the time of COVID too. And there's people you may know that have been affected by that as well. Um, one of the things that I always like to start out my conversations with is it most audiences, when I ask them this question, will say yes. How many, there's probably many of you that believe before you purchase something big that you research it. Let's just take a house, for example. Before you go buy a house, depending if you have kids, but you might research the school system. Is it a good system? Are your kids gonna get a good education? Um, are you moving to a, a safe area? You do your research, you wanna know, is that house, is it gonna hold its value? Am I gonna get my money out of it? Um, or maybe you go buy something at the store that's, um, you know, something that you more money than you've spent before. Maybe it's a new Bluetooth speaker. Um, and you want to know, is that the best speaker? Is it going to get the best sound? Am I getting what I want for the right price? A lot of us, no matter what it is, do our research. Um, we want to know what is it that we are buying? How can we make sure it lasts? So that leads to me to say that we all want that knowledge because we feel like we're in the driver's seat when we have that knowledge. Knowledge really is power. You feel better informed. Like, yes, I did my research on that refrigerator that I just bought. So I know it's gonna last because, or I hope it's gonna last because I did my due diligence. Now, we all know there are some times where people go out and buy things and it's impulsive and you maybe don't do the research and later on you're like, oh, I wish I would have known. But today, what I wanna to present to you is all about having that knowledge and that empowerment. You know, we all, a lot of us do believe and find strength in knowledge. If we know about it, we feel better about it, just as I said about purchasing something. So today, we're gonna to talk about SUDA. And in some cases, people in my audiences don't even know what SUDEP is. And it is sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. Which brings me to, before we start, I'm, I hope that you, and I know that many that I've often surveyed, believe that knowledge is power. And it helps you make those better decisions. And so for today, I'm not gonna dive into SUDEP just yet, but I want this to set the stage for you and what you're thinking. So I want to introduce Lydia. I'm wearing pink today. Lydia's colors there are pink. So we've got a pink heart in the background in my office. So I want to share a little bit about her. 11 years ago, I was blessed with a little girl. Now, I'm going to be honest because I'm working from home. I'm virtual as many of you are. I have three children and two of them are in the other room. So if I don't mention them, they probably might get a little upset. So I'm gonna mention them. Uh, 15 year old, Lydia, and then I have a nine year old. And um, the two uh, on the ends of Lydia are boys. But going back to Lydia, I'll, um, actually this is, <laughs> yeah, 13 years ago. This slide is old, I'm so sorry. 13 years ago, I was blessed with a little girl. Um, she was born with a rare chromosome disorder. At the time, they had, didn't have a name for it. They told me there was 50 people in the world with this rare chromosome disorder, and they called it 9Q34.3. They said, oh, she's missing uh, the end of her ninth chromosome, and we just don't have a name. But it eventually was named after a doctor, Dr. Kleefstra, which is a mouthful, um, Kleefstra syn syndrome. Um, I have a wonderful relationship with my own mother, so I was really excited about having a little girl. So when she was diagnosed, you know, little girls, the sassiness, the, you know, the sassy back, but I also look forward to um, shopping trips and things that we could do together. So it was hard when I got a diagnosis of a rare chromosome disorder. Um, the rare chromosome disorder um, leaves her with many challenges. 
um, bathing, feeding, dressing, um, and blessed me at the age of five and a half seeing her walk. So that was really exciting that that occurred. Um, Cleefstra syndrome has mental impairments. Um, some, depending we're on a spectrum, some kids are on a spectrum. It's almost like Down syndrome. There's spectrums depending on um, the severity of their syndrome. And uh, Lydia being pretty severe, she there's assistance with all activities of daily living. Um, and with this syndrome, for her also comes medical setbacks. Um, her first seizure was at one and a half. I remember it was um, a Labor Day weekend, very hot. We um, encountered this tonic-clonic seizure. My husband, we put her in the car and I said, okay, let's go to our children's hospital, which was 45 minutes away. My husband was so panicked behind the wheel. He said, no, we have to go to our local hospital. Um, but we didn't see anything after one and a half until about three, the age of three, where more seizures occurred. And they were tonic clonics, so they were visual. And a lot of times we thought, oh, she's um, becoming ill. That's why we're seeing these seizures. Um, but in 2013, she was diagnosed with a very rare nocturnal epilepsy called electrical status epilepticus in sleep, or ESES. And really what this meant is that um, there was seizing over 80% of her non-REM sleep. That's a lot. And it was invisible to the naked eye. So um, laying her to sleep um, looked like sleeping like a baby, um, but you couldn't, you couldn't visually see. Um, so, but I, at this point in 2013, when the diagnosis of ESES came, I never really knew that this would be the start of our journey. Now, remember I said she was at birth diagnosed with Kleefstra syndrome and, and you think, wow, that's a lot. My dream is changing. Um, what I wanted for my life is different than what it's going to be. And then epilepsy comes along with that, along with many, many other health challenges. And, um, you think, okay, that this is the next part of my journey, but I never knew really that there was even more. And the reason why I say that is that on Mother's Day 2014, I was with my mother celebrating um, Mother's Day. As a special needs mom, I never really got away. I, was, I worked full time, and then my off time was spent with my children. And so one weekend a year, I would spend with my mother um, in, a, in a touristy town of my home state of Wisconsin, and we would spend time together just enjoying each other's company, um, eating dinners quietly, and that would just be my weekend um, retreat and reprieve. Um, but on Mother's Day morning, I received the call from my husband, a call that no parents, no one or no parent really wants to hear ever. And through tears that I've never heard so hard before, he said, she's gone. And that, friends, is where my true journey began. So I know as you're sitting here listening to this, you might feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe you got a little bit of goosebumps like I am, because even six years later, um, it's hard. It's uncomfortable. I don't share this information to scare you. And for those living with epilepsy or the caregivers that are here today, this may be really hard. Hits your heart. Um, I know it does mine. It's, it's my child and, and here I am talking about it. I also know discussing grief can be awkward, especially this grief. And this discussion can be difficult but I want you to bear with me. Remember, at the top of this um, discussion, I 
I said something to you about knowledge is power. So I want you to stay focused on what I'm about to say next, what we're gonna, what I'm going to present. I want you to hold on because I want you to go back to those conversations where we all, you know, me was talking about knowledge is power. But if you were thinking about some of those things in your own life, I'm sure you thought too, yes, I do research. Yes, I do make sure I know things. And this is no different. This is your health or your loved one's health. And so we can, hopefully we can agree on that, that I want to educate you and empower you today. These discussions do not have to be difficult. They don't have to be hard, not with the right information. I have lost one of my most precious gifts. All of my children are gifts, but I lost one of my most precious gifts that I've been given in this life. Um, but I'm taking this journey, this really hard journey without my child and I'm turning it into good. I could have walked away. I, I, a lot of people tell me that. They say, you know what? You could have said, my child's gone. What else should I do? But you, did, but you didn't and I, and I didn't because I have found strength in this challenge, this challenge without my child. And I found strength to empower you. You are here for a reason. You are listening for a reason. Not only is the EF that invited you wonderful people and wonderful, great resources, but you put yourself in this seat. You've said, I want to be here. I want to learn more. And so while it feels uncomfortable, while it may feel awkward, may, you know, it's that elephant in the room. You are here, and that is a huge step. So I want to empower you. I want to inspire you. I want to strengthen you with this information. It's a really tough time right now with COVID. I get that too. It creates this whole other element of, of fear and um, uneasiness. But let's just take that out of the picture for right now. Let's just talk about SUDEP and your epilepsy. This information today may help you, it may help someone you love, and so I want you to walk away having more information than you came with. So use this knowledge you learned today to talk with your medical professionals. And I'm going to tell you something, force these conversations, even if your medical professionals haven't talked to you about them. You know, a year, year and a half ago, my neighbor's daughter, um, who coincidentally or not coincidentally was best friends with my daughter, um, loved her to death at school and pushed her on the playground. We ended up moving next to them. Well, her daughter also had epilepsy. Um, and about a year and a half ago in the late at night, she had a seizure. And so I followed her mom to the hospital, to our ER, where our emergency doctor did not know about SUDEP didn't know about the risks of SUDEP. And so I sat there and educated him and I educated his nurse, which the nurse then came to me and said, I'd like to talk to you about my brother. He has epilepsy and he's not taking his medications regularly. What are his risks? So it's about educating and I do it in all places all the time. And I want you to take this knowledge today and drive these conversations, drive them, force them, have them. And you're gonna have the knowledge to do so. Um, I want you, if you're feeling a little weak in the knees today, a little kind of pit in the stomach of, gosh, this is hard, I want you to channel my strength because, as I mentioned, this, this is something I wanted to do so that I could help others. All right, I'm going to move to my next slide. Um, this is something that I saw that resonated with me when I first started working with the SUDEP Institute. The most painful goodbyes are the ones that are never said and never explained. I left for the weekend for my daughter on a Friday and she passed on a Sunday. And before I left, I went, I took her to school and dropped her off and gave her a ton of kisses and the the aides were like, okay, mom, you're going to see her at three today. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm going um, away for the weekend. I won't be home till Sunday. But it's one thing that I did give her lots of kisses, told her I loved her. She gave me the stink eye, like, come on, mom, go. I'm going to school, I'm going to my place. Um, but it still hurts that um, 
it was so sudden. Families and people in the community, because I talk to people all the time, believe that epilepsy is a disease we live with, we, not die, we don't die from. I talk to people on planes all the time when I'm traveling and they're like, wow, I didn't know. I just thought you took a medication and you were fine. Uh, people don't know about this. And so today, again, we're gonna take this knowledge and create your own power. And I know I say it, I've said it a couple of times and I wanna keep reiterating that so you feel that, that strength today. So let's get in and talk about sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. So the, by definition, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDEP occurs when a seemingly healthy person with epilepsy dies without a known cause. Now, what does that mean? So when someone passes from epilepsy, the medical examiner can't outwardly see if they look in the brain, they cannot see if it was an, a seizure that caused it. So for instance, when my daughter died and I was on the way home um, from, um, when I was on the way home from the visit with my mom, I called one of her main physicians at her local children's hospital and I said, should I get an autopsy? What do you think? And he said, well, you can't, you can't know if it was due to by looking at the brain and the autopsy. So what medical examiners do here is they look to see if there was anything else that may have caused that. So when they say seemingly healthy person, you might think, oh, well, they have epilepsy, that's not healthy. But what they do is they look at other things. Um, you know, was there gastric problems? Was there something else that may have caused this death? So that's what the medical examiners do. And we wanna make sure that the medical examiners know about SUDEP. And that's one thing that we don't, we don't entirely have. We want to make sure the statistics are there, and I don't mean to sound cold or harsh, but in order for the statistics to be there, we need those SUDEPs to be examined. So when somebody dies unexpected and it's unexplained, we hope, and we, the SUDEP Institute and Epilepsy Foundation across the country looks to educate the medical examiners so that those statistics can be there because that'll help with identifying research, it'll identify funds for research, et cetera. And we want them to have the right cause of death for an individual. So one of the things that I've done is I've gone to the medical examiner's conference. Uh, there is a white paper that was written about um, in 2018 for the medical examiner audience so that, they, so that they know, so that it can have the right statistics, they can look for that. And so, one of one of the deaths recently in the news was Cameron Boyce. Cameron Boyce was a Disney actor who passed away last July 6th from SUDEP. And his death certificate actually does say sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. So those medical examiners, they were already well versed and well trained in knowing what to look for when it was sudden and unexplained. But as I mentioned, some medical examiners aren't aware of it. So for instance, in Mississippi, there was an individual with, um, with epilepsy and he was uh, an avid volunteer with the Epilepsy Foundation of Mississippi and he passed away. And the medical examiner did not wanna look into SUDEP. And so th the foundation from Mississippi contacted me and said, can you help us um, really convince this ME to look into SUDEP. So I sent the white paper I mentioned, I sent some other materials and they were educated and they then put on his um, death certificate as SUDEP. And then his family also um, donated some of his information and specimens to the North American SUDEP registry out of New York for the research they do specifically on SUDEP. So that's what happens when um, there is a death in epilepsy. And again, I don't mean to sound cold or harsh, but I wanna give you those details. If you or someone you know, unfortunately does pass um, from epilepsy, you wanna make sure to educate the medical examiner. Most often, that is how those diagnoses or those diagnostics come on, a, um, on an autopsy, during an autopsy is based on the fact that the, the family has shared that they have a history of epilepsy. Um, another thing with the greatest risk factors for SUDEP are uncontrolled seizures. 
you want to make sure that you try to control those seizures as much as you can. And that was something that I did, tried to do with my daughter. My daughter had intractable epilepsy. She seized, and no matter what we were doing, whether we talked about medications or, or surgery, we tried to control those seizures as much as we, can, we could. And so that is something you wanna look at um, for your loved one or for you. And then those, they found that risk factors also include those that have generalized tonic-clonic seizures um, as well. And then they, they have found in, in the work of the research is that three or more generalized tonic-clonic seizures also put someone at risk uh, of SUDEP. You um, also wanna make sure, and I'm going to try to, you also want to make sure that um, risk factors that could be included is stopping medications that you're on. So um, abruptly stopping or not taking as prescribed. Um, you want to make sure that that also doesn't put you at risk and making sure you take your medications. We're going to talk some, about some other um, risks as well in a little bit. So sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, um, about one in 1,000 people with epilepsy will die from SUDEP. Um, it is a very rare occurrence. I want to let you know it is a rare occurrence, but it is something that should be discussed with your medical team and your medical professionals, even though it is rare. Years ago, um, the AAN, the American Academy of Neurology, said it was one in 1,000 adults and one in one one in 4,500 children. You may see those stats from time to time still, but those researchers that worked in this and the doctors that worked on that um, statement have now since said, no, it's one out of 1,000 people. And we'll see those AAN guidelines being revised in, in the near future. As I mentioned, the three or more generalized tonic clonics and the best way to work to prevent SUDEP is to strive for as few seizures as possible. So let's get into what causes SUDEP. I want to preface this conversation right here by saying I am not a doctor, um, but I've been in this space now for many years. I've been, I lived with someone with epilepsy and since being with the SUDEP Institute have met countless researchers, doctors, and individuals working on solving SUDEP. Um, back when my daughter was alive, I would walk into the hospital with her and, and I would be talking about her medical background, um, what diagnostic test she had, what, what happened a week ago, what medicine she took, and I could rattle everything off. And I was often asked, are you a nurse? Are you a doctor? Do you have a medical degree? And I'd always say no, but I, I play one in real life. So um, after 25 times of her being hospitalized, being in an ambulance over 19 times and following her, I had a lot of experience in the medical space. Plus with my degree and now being the director of the SUDEP Institute, a lot of exposure. So although I'm not a doctor, um, if there is one on this webinar, I welcome them to answer any questions as well. But I wanted to share what um, I know and what we know from the Epilepsy Foundation is unfortunately the cause of SUDEP is still unknown. But research has come so far. And a lot of times when I hear someone has lost a loved one to suit up, they'll say, but there's no research out there. And that's absolutely not true. Um, it has come so far in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, there is a woman out of New York. Her son died 18 years ago from suit up. And she, we kind of call her the matriarch because she's really um, put her foot forward to make sure that this, the conversation continues. Um, the NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health, just got done funding almost $27 million into research for SUDEP. And those physicians and researchers that, that were part of that, that funding, they have not stopped and they're not going to stop. They want to keep these conversations going. They want to keep the research going. They're just looking now for separate funding for it. But those folks have not stopped just because their big grants stopped from the NIH. So when you look at the causes of SUDEP, the things that are being um, investigated are abnormal breathing, abnormal heart rhythms, brain function, and then mixes or cause of those, you know, mixes of maybe one or two of those are kind of like this quiet storm of many. SUDEP um, often occurs at night or during sleep, uh, often is not witnessed, 
leaving many questions unanswered. Um, there may be evidence that the person has a seizure, but this isn't always the case um, that they have a seizure. And when we talk about breathing, heart rhythms, brain function, let me, let me dive into that a little bit more. So when we say breathing, a seizure may cause a person to have pauses in breathing or apnea. And if these pauses are too long, they can reduce the oxygen in the blood to a life-threatening level. So in addition, during a convulsive seizure, a person's airwaves may also be obstructed or covered, leading to suffocation. You may have heard of a pillow that was developed overseas. I wanna say it's in the UK, it's a honeycomb pillow. And they sell those so that way, if you do turn over during a seizure, that you can still have a breathing mechanism through this pillow. Another thing that they're looking at in the research is heart rhythm. I, I just talked to the doctor last week that he actually was a cardiologist, but became interested in SUDEP when um, he heard about it. And now he studies um, the cardiac um, rhythm with SUDEP. And rarely a seizure may cause a dangerous heart rhythm or even heart failure. So that is being looked into along with brain function. And what we mean by brain function is that seizures may interfere with the function of the vital areas in the brain stem um, that controls breathing and heart function. So you see where I'm talking about causes or mixed causes. If these happen, the brain areas may not work right and it can cause those breathing and heart problems. Um, with the causes and mixed causes, SUDEP may result from more or one cause or a combination involving the breathing difficulty, the abnormal heart rhythm, um, or it may result from factors that researchers have yet to discover. So there is research going on. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how the Epilepsy Foundation is helping drive that research. And I'm excited about what we're doing to have to further these discussions. So as you're sitting here, you might be saying, okay, she's told me about SUDEP. We don't know exactly what causes it. They're working on it, but how can I reduce my risk? So here are some things that you can do to reduce this risk. We know that poorly controlled seizures can help increase the risk. So we wanna make sure that you take your medications regularly and reliably as prescribed. It's really funny. Um, that some people will be like, okay, um, you know, I, I took my medication today, but they didn't take it around the time that they should. So maybe it's a young person and they stayed up till 2 a.m. and then they got up at noon and they took their medication at noon, whereas they normally maybe take it at eight. You need to take this medication regularly and reliably and help reduce that risk. Um, we also need to discuss all treatment options with your doctor. So treatment options, including is surgery an option? Is that something you should be discussing? Is a change in diet an option? Are you on the right medications? There are medications coming out um, you know, that might be on, available to you. Is that a better option for you than what you've been taking? Body chemistry changes all the time. Are you on the right dosage? So are you going back regularly, getting your, you know, talking to your doctor, do you need an EEG? Um, are you on the right dosage level? Has your body changed? Um, make sure you're having those discussions. And that goes to making sure you have the right doctor as well. A lot of people, um, you know, they go to their general neurologist, but there's also epilepsy centers where there's an epileptologist. They receive a few more years in training specifically about epilepsy. And if you can, we encourage you to get to one of those epilepsy centers, talk with an epileptologist, and have these really, really important discussions. When you talk about taking your medications regularly and reliably, it's also important to keep your medical appointments. Too often I hear, well, I was seizure free, so I just you know, went back for a regular checkup, but really didn't you know, do anything, and, or I was fine, so I just stopped taking my medication, and I didn't go back to see the doctor. And that's really important is keeping those medical appointments. Even though you feel healthy, the epilepsy medication stops the seizures, but you still need to know more and have those appointments, 
is you again do you need to change your medication do you need something else do you need a, a, a dosage change getting those low levels checked so it's so important even though that you feel good and you might be seizure free that you continue to keep those appointments the other thing is to talk to your doctor about a cardiac evaluations if your seizures is poorly controlled do you need to have a cardiac uh, a workup and and have that discussion with your doctor and determine whether or not that would be beneficial to you and then the next thing is talk to your physician about nighttime monitoring you know there are many devices on uh, the market there is a watch it's um, it's called Empatica it's the embrace uh, watch and this monitors seizures um, and it can actually send a text to someone that you designate a loved one a caregiver a neighbor so that they can check on you i'm going to take a drink for a second so sorry now, as you can tell my favorite color is pink i've got my Sudep institute um, water bottle i've got pink back here um, my daughter's my daughter's color so i wear it a lot um, regarding devices, you want to make sure that you talk to your doctor to see if a device uh, like a watch would be beneficial to you. Um, I, at the Student Institute, love to partner with individuals. Danny did is a foundation out of Chicago, Illinois. Danny died at age four due to his epilepsy, and his family formed a foundation to help fund uh, people who need help with devices. So if you talk to your doctor and they say, you know, a watch would be beneficial or maybe a mattress pad to alert someone or maybe a pillow or a seizure dog, you might want to contact Danny Did and see if, if you don't have the funds that they might be able to help you with a watch or some device um, such as that. But it's important to, to talk to your doctor. And again, Danny Did is a great organization. We can't solve SUDEP by ourselves, and so I like to partner with other organizations to work together with our community. I think it's so, so important. All right, so um, again, reducing your risk of SUDEP. One of the things that we really encourage, and I love to hear Carrie talk about the seizure um, training, is that you do need to have that training or a response or action plans um, we really encourage you to have a, a plan for a hospital response. It's important that loved ones in your household or caregivers or roommates or whoever it might be um, know what to do next. If you have a rescue medication, to have that there and available and in, available to use for someone. Having that seizure response and action plan, I talked to so many people living with epilepsy and i can't tell you the countless number that say no i don't have an action plan i don't have a response plan people i live with don't know who to call they don't know phone numbers they don't know anything you know i i recently went on a vacation with a bunch of um, friends of mine and um my one friend passed out at dinner and i didn't have her husband's phone number I didn't know what medication she was on, anything. And the paramedics came. And at the end of that, and in the role that I'm in, I said to my friends, next time, we need to all have our spouse's phone numbers or a significant other so that we can contact them. And that's just as important, if not more here with epilepsy, is having those seizure action plans and response plans. And um, involve everyone that you know that you can to, to help you. Also, as I mentioned, Carrie mentioned earlier, seizure first aid. Repositioning people from the prone position, which is flat on your face, and mild stimulation has been thought to help um, reduce the risk of, of, of SUDA. So that is also something as well. So questions ask your medical professionals. I am not gonna go through all this. We have a flyer on um, epilepsy.com forward slash SUDEP, and I'm sure the folks um, here at EF could give you this flyer. It's called SUDEP colon knowledge is power, and it has all of these questions. We want you to take this flyer and take it to your physicians. Um, more often than not, what I hear is that people did not know about SUDEP when a loved one died. And the physicians, unfortunately, more often than not, don't talk about it. We have some excellent physicians that do. And I think since 
Cameron Boyce has passed and more notable folks have passed from SUDEP, you are hearing that conversation um, driven a lot more. But um, um, it is it is something that often isn't talked about. So that's why this knowledge for you is to drive these questions. Um, I will tell you that I think if you drive the conversation with physicians who don't talk about it, they're gonna be a little bit more comfortable that you know about it. Um, death is a hard topic to talk about and uh, physicians you know, may not have that training like oncologists who talk about, okay, you have six months to live or whatnot, they may not have that formal training. And so if you bring it up, I think it creates a comfort level of knowing about it and then you can have that candid conversation. So my daughter, um, although I knew about SUDEP and I knew the risk, my daughter was had nocturnal seizures. Um, I saw my daughter's physician sometime after she passed and I said, why didn't you talk about it with me? Why didn't you mention it? I ordered the medical records, I combed through them, I didn't see any mention. And he said, a lot of times it's the anxiety of the person sitting across from him dealing with the epilepsy in the first place, much less then talking about SUDEP. And that's hard, he's trying to give people hope. And I totally understand that. Um, so you, if you drive that conversation, I think that eases up a little bit and makes it an environment where you can have a candid discussion. And your first step to doing that is sitting right here today with me. So I'm so thankful that you are doing that. Some of the questions that, um, <coughs> excuse me, that you might ask is what is my risk? What can I do? Um, are there ways to control seizures? Um, and one of my favorite questions that's on the knowledge is power flyer that I mentioned is does low risk mean no risk? Um, important question to ask. And I'm trying to advance the slides. Um, should we change my current medications? Are there specific activities? What instructions or guidance should I give to my family and friends? Should I consider snaring a bedroom or a device? All things that we talked about previously. You know, another story that I wanna share with you is a, um, last summer, a woman emailed me and she said, my son has electrical status epilepticus in sleep or ESES, which is the same rare epilepsy my daughter had. And she said, can my son die? And here I am, the director of the Student Institute. My daughter has passed. And I found it hard to have these discussions. So while I say that physicians aren't having these discussions, to a certain point, I get it because it's hard. How do you do this? How do you approach it? But I know that as the Epilepsy Foundation, that it's my job to educate you and it's educate this woman who contacted me. And so I messaged her and I said, I, I, we emailed back and forth so I could find out as much detail as I, as I possibly could. And then I said, let's talk. And we got on the phone and I said, if you Google me, you will see that my daughter died. But that doesn't mean that your son will. That doesn't mean that's the outcome for him. But here, let me give you this information. And here are the questions you should be asking. Here's the physicians you should be seeking out for care. Here's what you should be doing all the things that I've shared thus far with you. And I was nervous. I was so nervous for her response because here I am talking about something she didn't know about. And I said to her at the end, all right, now given all this information, how are you feeling right now? What are your thoughts? And she gave me an answer that was totally unexpected. She said, for the first time, someone told me the truth about what I need to do, what I need to ask, where I need to go. She goes, I've been looking for these answers and I didn't have them and you've just empowered me. She used the word and she goes, you've inspired me. I feel great. Now I know what to do to take control and do as much as I can for my son. And I was so elated that I was able to do that. So again, it's, it's a tough conversation, but feel this empowerment to go do it. The next thing I want to um, talk about is our mission here at the SUDEP Institute. We've talked a little bit about SUDEP or we've talked a lot about SUDEP, but I wanna talk to you about the Institute. We have a short and sweet mission and that is to um, eradicate SUDEP and support those affected by it. 
when I was hired and interviewed, they said the main goal of my job is that I am out of a job because we've sold suit up. And I couldn't be more pleased with that outcome because my daughter has died from it and so many others. And I, if we can solve this and fix it so no one else dies, that is absolutely what I want. I will be out of a job. And maybe contacting one of you here, but I will, I will be happy to be out of a job so no one else loses their life. So specific goals of the Epilepsy Foundation Up Institute is to support and promote our current biomarker challenge. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. And registry pro programs, like I mentioned, the North American Up Registry Program. If you're someone that likes to donate to science and research and you are living with epilepsy, you can actually um, donate, or not donate, but um, become part of the research by sharing your medical records and other things with the North American Suit Up Re uh, Registry. They need controls like that, um, like individuals living with epilepsy, so feel free to reach out to them. We also build partnerships and support additional research um, because we do want to end Suit Up. The other thing that we do is provide education and awareness. I travel the country. I have partnered with the Cameron Boyce Foundation who lost Cameron last year to bring awareness and education um, last fall, I was in November, I was on Good Morning America talking about SUDEP and epilepsy. In January, I was on the daytime show, The Doctors, where we talked about more about SUDEP. And just two weeks ago, I was on Good Morning America and ABC News social media talking about um, SUDEP and mitigating risks and knowing about it. We want more to know about it. We want everyone to be aware. I want it to be like SIDS, where um, if people are diagnosed with epilepsy, that the immediate conversation that is right there with the physicians to talk about reducing risk. And um, we want those living with epilepsy and the caregivers and the medical examiners to, to all know about it. And then finally, should someone pass from epilepsy, whether it be SUDEP, sudden unexpected death, or from an accident, or even now in these times, if someone is living with epilepsy and they pass from COVID or a drowning, um, we offer bereavement services. And that is free to anyone that needs that to support them in their loss surrounding the death from epilepsy. So let's talk about the Biomarker Challenge and SUDEP Coalition Summit. I mentioned that um, we have a biomarker challenge and what we are looking for, and we've had a, a challenge going on for the last few years, is we are looking for the development of a predictive biomarker. And I'm sure some of you are sitting wondering, like, what does that mean? And what that means is that we're looking for something that says, yes, they are at a risk for SUDEP and it can help prevent SUDEP. It may not solve SUDEP, so it may not say, well, this is what causes it, but it would prevent it. So let me give you an example a doctor gave me. It's kind of like the um, gene for breast cancer, um, the BRCA gene. You know, a lot of women can get tested for that BRCA gene, find out they're carrying the gene, and then take preventative measures to um, hopefully reduce or eliminate their risk of getting breast cancer. That may be a hysterectomy or a mastectomy or whatnot. But that is, it's almost, that is almost like a biomarker. Um, it could also be a device, a device that can prevent um, seizures from happening. It doesn't have to be a genetic abnormality. It could be a device that prevents it from happening. So we have put uh, this task out there to say, hey, if somebody can um, submit a biomarker, we will award them $800,000 and we're accepting those, um, those uh, submissions until October 10th of this year. And then another thing that the SUDEP Institute is doing is I talked earlier about the NIH having this funds for research. And for me, uh, from the moment I was interviewed, I realized that I didn't want those conversations to end. And we needed to bring everybody that's working on SUDEP together. And so we've, um, it's an invite only event, but it's 50 researchers and physicians and individuals from around the world who are working on SUDEP and we have convened them together and since January have put them in work groups, whether it be public health and epidemiology, awareness and education, basic science. We've brought them in, they're in their work groups and we are working on a five year action plan to end SUDEP. I told them the goal was, I do not wanna walk away with another white paper and um, medical paper, 
I want items of action so that we can end suit up. So I'm really um, pleased that we've all come together, a very large response of individuals that wanted to be part of this. We sent out the invitation and within you know days, people were saying, yes, I want to be part of this event. And so I'm excited for this because I'm really hoping good outcomes. Our first meeting is in June where all the work groups come together to say, this is what we've put together. And then we'll be meeting again. And my goal is that we can do this quarterly to keep these conversations going. So I'm gonna end today's discussion. I probably went a little bit over and I'm so sorry, but um, you know, I want to make sure that these work resources are available to you. You can find the Suit Up Institute on Facebook. Uh, just look for Suit Up Institute forward slash Epilepsy Foundation. The Suit Up Registry, the North American Suit Up Registry is there. And then we also have um, PAMI, Partners Against Mortality. And that is a conference specifically around suit up and death from epilepsy. Um, we did not have it as planned this year in June, but if fingers crossed, if we can travel again, we're looking to have it around the American Epilepsy Society Conference and hopefully we'll have some good information come out of that. And of course, your Epilepsy Foundation of Eastern Pennsylvania who are always so welcoming and warm. And to me, to, to come here as one of their programs to present to you and to educate you um, and I want to close with that. I, I, a lot of people thank me for being in this role and channeling my loss. Um, my daughter was, um, did a lot for me in her seven years. She was one of my best teachers. She taught me a lot about life perspective, um, what's important um, in life. And I learned more from her in seven years than I think I will in my lifetime. And so for me, this role is not only professional, but it, it is extremely personal. Um, I am here empowering, educating, and hopefully inspiring those living with epilepsy to do more, to ask more, to be their advocate, to find strength so that they don't incur this immense loss like myself and many others that I talk to every day have incurred. Um, and that is what we do here at the Suit Up Institute. So this is the only way I know how to move forward is to help others using her loss as that strength for others like you. And so thank you for having me here today and listening and being strong and taking what you know and now taking that back and using it um, for yourself. So thank you so much. Um, please let me know if there's any questions. Thank you, Sally, for that very informative presentation. Uh, we also have Dr. Chris Skidmore with us this evening. Dr. Chris Skidmore of Jefferson Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. Uh, he will be helping to facilitate questions that might be on more of a medical side as they pertain to SUDEP. I saw so let me, his name, and I think he was in our uh, October session last year, correct? That's correct. Nice to see Thanks. you again. Nice to see you again. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Skidmore. So let's look at um, some of the questions that came in. The first one that I have is, can someone who has come close to SUDEP get brain damage? I'm going to kick that over to Dr. Skidmore. So um, there's not there's not like a close to SUDEP. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. su sudden unexplained death is sudden, and so it, it occurs suddenly and uh, often um, kind of when you least expect it. Uh, even you know, unfortunately, one of my uh, uh, cases of SUDEP was in somebody that did all the right things, was in the emergency room, and did everything possible and then you know had a, a, a sudden unexplained death at home after leaving the hospital so um, there's no close uh, close calls with SUDEP it either happens or it doesn't happen um, but you know obviously the goal is to try to minimize your seizures to try to decrease the severity of the seizures if you cannot achieve seizure freedom um, because we do know that the tonic clonic seizures and very frequent seizures increase your risk of SUDEP. Thank you. Our next question is, and I think this is in relation to Sally's presentation. Um, it says, can you elaborate on mild 
stimulation. I think you said that in one of your slides and it was kind of, you said that it can help to prevent SUDEP. Sally? Are some of the, mute? Some yeah. of the research has shown, I think it was from a 2015 study that mild stimulation may, um, uh, I don't even know the right words, Dr. Skidmore, but, um, arouse them, arouse them um, during, uh, if, 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 I don't want to say if sudden and unexpected death is going to occur, but arouse them from that seizure um, and maybe not come out of it. I'm lacking the right words, but. Yeah, so I think in, in that postictal period. Yes. When, when yes. somebody has the, 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 um, the brain's control over your respirations can be suppressed. So you're not necessarily recognizing that you need to breathe or you know so that way the mild stimulation tries to arouse that person kind of get them out of that state um and so that's thing that's kind of what they're referring to in the research and it's and part I, of basic okay. seizure first aid right thank you and i i'm not I, I don't know if that research has concluded that that actually will prevent it but it is suggested to do Dr. Skidmore, can you just clarify what postictal means to those who may not know? Sure. So um, the seizure itself is called the ictus or the event, and the postictal period is that that period of time after the seizure has ended. So if it, if there is movement during the seizure, and then all of a sudden the seizure stops, and then usually people are uh, they might be sleeping, they may be very taking very deep and labored breathing. Uh, almost like snoring or kind of struggling to get air in um, and be very confused and groggy. So it's that period of time after the seizure has ended before the person or the patient becomes fully back to normal. Thank you. And we have and one I, more question and here. I, should oh, add, I, think, I think that varies. The timing of that post period varies for everyone. My daughter was usually around 30 minutes where she would be very groggy, very tired, and, and then immediately come up and be fine, whereas some people say, I'm tired for days after a seizure. So everybody's post period and responses are different. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. Is SUDEP associated only with tonic-clonic seizures, or can it occur with partial complex, partial, and absence? Did you want to take this one, doctor? Because sure, we, we've the, learned that it's not only uh, tonic clonics. Correct. Um, although um, absence, um, to my knowledge, there's never been a reported case of SUDEP with absence. Um, but certainly with complex partial seizures, individuals that are having very frequent seizures, and then generalized tonic clonic seizures being at the worst risk on the spectrum. Thank you so much. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a believer of the comment of no risk or low, low risk means no risk. Um, and I've, I've always said to anyone having any type of epilepsy that they should always be talking with their physician about it and make sure they have these action plans and responses and people are aware of it. So, Okay, let me see. Insular seizures, Dr. Skidmore. Yeah, so I mean, that's, a, that's an outstanding question, right? So the insular lobe of your brain, so there's different parts of your brain. So if we look at my brain here, the frontal lobe in the front, kind of then the parietal lobe, which is kind of where we do our kind of sensation, followed by the occipital lobe in the back, and then the temporal lobe. And then the insular lobe is actually deeper, kind of hidden beneath the frontal and the temporal lobes. The insular lobe of the brain is involved in a lot of the automatic functions of the body, so uh, respiration and heartbeat. And so it's actually a great question. Um, people have done studies to try to understand uh, if, um, so first of all, insular epilepsy and insular seizures are rare. They're, um, uh, seizures from the temporal lobe and the frontal lobes are the most common, uh, partly because of geography, they're the largest, you know, the, those two make up the largest area of the brain. So insular seizures are uncommon. Um, people have tried to look at seizures um, coming from the left side of the brain versus the right side of the brain because it's thought that the left insular might speed up the heart rate more and the right insular might slow it down. And unfortunately, none of that has really panned out. But uh, people are certainly okay. trying to understand the, the relationship between seizures and then 
the reality is our brain controls everything else in our body from our heart beating to our respirations and everything else. And um, so we're trying to then understand how does the seizure then trigger those centers? Because uh, as Sally kind of alluded to, you know, the concern is some people after a seizure stop breathing. Some people after a seizure, their heart can stop beating. Um, but we, we don't right now understand and cannot identify easily which patients are at risk for that. And so that's the challenge. And that's why we need that biomarker that Sally was kind of referring to. So I'm hearing you say that there is no conclusive um, evidence whether or not insular seizures increase the risk for SUDEP, correct? Yeah, there's no, there's no evidence one way or the other. Okay, okay. Okay, I think that wraps it up for our questions this evening for this session. So Sally, thank you very much. Dr. Skidmore, thanks for joining us. My We'd pleasure. We'd be happy if either or both of you would like to stick around for the rest of our program tonight. That would be outstanding. But we understand if you have something else. <laughs> thank you so much for having me once again. And Dr. Skidmore, thank you for joining to answer some of these other in-depth medical questions. And have a great uh, rest of your session. I will be signing off. But thank you so much. Thank you, Sally. So at this point, I am going to um, share my screen with you once again so that I can introduce, and let's hope it goes a lot smoother than it did last time, everybody. Hey. So um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Uh, Catherine Davis, um, and she's going to talk about emerging treatments for epilepsy. So welcome, Dr. Davis. Um, Kate Davis is currently an assistant professor and assistant director in the Penn Epilepsy Center. She is medical director of Penn's Epilepsy Monitoring Unit. She is a graduate of Yale School of Medicine. She completed her residency in neurology and fellowship in epilepsy at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Her research interests are in neuroimaging in epilepsy. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you for having me. Let me see if I can pull this off. Um, okay, there we go. Great. Um, just trying to bring it to the full screen. that see if that works. It went black for me. Maybe it didn't work. Oh, it did. Now I just hit escape because I was being too impatient. Um, <laughs> Give me a second. Okay, I'm going to try to do a full screen again because I think it'll look better when you when you are trying to follow it. So just give a moment for it to pop up. So um, while it's while it's coming up, um, I'm going to um, talk about uh, the emerging treatments for drug resistant epilepsy and just have this as a disclosure. Um, so I think first, just a quick definition of drug resistant epilepsy. Um, and uh, the International League Against Epilepsy has this consensus statement that I think pretty much everyone agrees with at this point, that it's defined as the failure of two appropriately chosen and tolerated seizure medications, either taken as one at a time or monotherapy or together to control seizures. And that really comes from um, some really robust studies that have been done that show that once you get to that third medication or multiple drugs, that the chance of becoming seizure-free is quite low, only at about 4% from this one major study. Um, and so uh, at that point, we um, consider other treatment options. And so these are the current treatment options for drug-resistant epilepsy. And I'm going to focus on the first, in the first part of the talk in a Dr. new- Dr. Davis? Yes. I'm yes. gonna interrupt you just a moment. We're only seeing a white screen right now. Oh, on our okay. end. Okay. Weird. I'm sorry. No, I appreciate you telling me. Let me see. Maybe I have to do it. Um, can you see uh, my, my slide I can now? see the slide now. I can see the slide. It's not full screen, but I can see the slide. Okay. If you go to slideshow at the top. I did that. That's what I was doing. I had it in slideshow. Okay. Maybe if I um, bring it big like this, is that working? Or should I, I? We can see the slide now. Okay, it's this is Chris. We can read it. You can read it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I had it in. Yeah, we I can had read it. it. In, I definitely had it in slideshow, so that doesn't working. I probably should just try it this way so that 
we can That's keep fine. going uh, for the sake thanks. of time. So um, thanks for letting me know. So I don't think you missed anything. So I'm going to come back to kind of the similar graphics in a later slide. But um, first part of the talk, I'll, I'll discuss some of the new seizure medications that are coming out, you know, since some of that data about um, the chance of of becoming seizure free with the current medication. So um, to give hope for additional trials with medications. And then in the second uh, part of the talk, I'll talk about some of the new um, surgical options and device options for drug resistant epilepsy. So, okay. And so um, there have been a lot of drugs that have come out over the last 25 years. And this is a fairly old slide, not including some of the drugs that I'll discuss today. Um, so you can see there's countless um, medications almost over um, the multiple generations of seizure medications. And I think it's important to keep in mind before we talk about the new drugs that those that are listening that um, are um, on initial therapies with epilepsy um, or who are already on several medications and well controlled, maybe more, maybe on the, the list here. And these are really the, the drugs that from expert consensus are recommended as the most appropriate drugs for generalized epilepsy um, here on the left side and for focal epilepsy with the newest addition to this list being Lacosamide or Vimpat. So um, the new medications I'll talk today are not the first choice seizure medications, but are ones that may be considered later in the treatment decision um, uh, tree for patients with um, drug resistant epilepsy. So when I said before, when you fail two drugs, the chance of becoming seizure free is quite low. So um, once you get to that third seizure medication with um, more trials, you're only getting a combination of about a 4% chance of seizure freedom. But a, a newer study from that same large study that generated this um, data uh, looked at whether in patients that kept on trying more drugs for 10 years, how many of those patients actually gain seizure control with just drug trials alone instead of epilepsy surgery. And actually an additional 4% of patients um, became seizure free um, uh, with additional drug trials over that 10 year period. And that's data from 2010. So do we have any new drugs since 2010? And that's really what I was going to focus on today is going through some of the new drug options that we have um, to treat uh, patients since that uh, data came out. So the first one I'll discuss is a, a medication um, called eslicarbazepine, which is a mouthful. So um, we'll call it Aptium, which is the brand name, which I don't usually uh, opt for using the brand name, but in this case, that generic name is quite a mouthful. So this medication is really closely related to um, oxcarbazepine, or the brand name for that is trileptal. Um, uh, but it potentially has a, a better side effect profile because it avoids exposure to some of the uh, metabolites from the trileptal drug. And so potentially this is a good option that might limit side effects um, that a patient may have when they're taking trileptal and also has the advantage of being once a day dosing. Of course, with all the drugs that I'll talk about, um, today that are newer, the big disadvantage is cost because these are all um, still brand only medications. So this is just quickly showing um, from the trial, uh, the responder rate in the in using Aptium. And this is um, you know, the, per the percentage of patients compared to placebo here in white um, that had uh, the percentage of seizure, reduction in seizures. And you can see that um, it, it was, there was a dose response, meaning with the higher dose of 1200 milligrams, um, patients had a more significant decrease in seizures, but in both groups, even the lower dose, there was a significant reduction in seizures with this medicine in comparison to taking a placebo, which is like a sugar pill. Um, so who is this, wh who, what patients are these, is this drug appropriate for? This drug is studied in partial or focal onset seizures. Um, and I won't go through all the dosing here, um, but it can be um, easily transitioned from trileptal or oxcarbazepine um, if you're having side effects with that drug. 
And um, the common side effects are similar to oscarbazepine and to other drugs in the sodium channel agent class, which is the class of medication this falls into, which includes dizziness and tiredness and nausea. That all gets worse as you get up to higher doses. Um, so the higher doses, like 1200 milligrams, will have more side effects than the lower doses. So another newer drug is uh, Brevetorazetam, or some people call it Briv, or the, generic, the brand name is Briviact. Um, this drug is really similar to one of our really commonly prescribed and used medications, Keppra or Levetorazetam. And it has the same mechanism, which is an SV2A inhibitor, which is um, a, a part of the glutamate synapse, which is the um, most common, uh, the glutamate is the most common uh, excitatory um, chemical in your brain. So it's um, a, a chemical that's very commonly targeted in treating seizure seizures. Um, it was hoped that because this uh, drug was a little bit more targeted towards that um, SB2A inhibition, that it would have less side effects than um, Keppra. And um, in the trial, it was, uh, the drug was actually interestingly more effective than placebo. This time placebo is, is brown. Um, in all of the doses studied. So even at the, the starter dose, we saw um, that it was effective and significantly more effective than placebo. Um, with this drug, there was a three to 5% chance of seizure freedom in the drug trial population. So the patients that are enrolled in drug trials in all of the studies I'll talk to, talk to you about um, uh, have typically failed many seizure medications and fit within that definition of drug-resistant um, epilepsy. So um, what kind of patient is Briviact appropriate for? Um, it's approved in partial or focal onset seizures, but it also is used in generalized seizure disorders sometimes, um, similar to how we use Keppra. Um, and it, it can be started um, right off the bat at a therapeutic dose, um, which is one of the benefits of this medication. You don't need to initially go up um, on a low dose and go very slowly. And you can, if there are side effects, go even lower than that initial uh, uh, dose. It's really uncertain, as you might have picked up, whether the higher doses are more effective than the lower doses, because they all seem to work as about as well as one another in the clinical trial. Um, uh, but still, your clinician may recommend that you increase the dose um, because it is the case with all of our other seizure medicines that as you go up on the dose, a typically seizure, you'll, your seizure control that you'll get will improve as well. Um, it's important to know that it's very similar to Keppra, like I said before, so we don't use these medicines together. But if you're having side effects on Keppra, we can switch you very quickly just overnight from Briviact over to this, I mean, from Keppra over to this medication. Most common side effect is tiredness or fatigued. And um, we often the, uh, clinically will switch uh, patients from Keppra if they have irritability or behavior changes with Keppra, which is a side effect that we commonly see. We'll switch them to um, this new medication, Brevetorazetam, hoping that that will help with some of those side effects. And I personally um, have found that to be helpful in some patients. So another newer medication is parampanol, or the brand name is Bicompa. This medication is, is interesting because it has a new um, mechanism of action, uh, also working on glutamate, that uh, excitatory chemical that I mentioned before, um, but it blocks a different um, receptor, the amphaglutamate receptor right here. Um, and um, interesting about this drug is it has been shown to actually work in both um, partial seizures or focal seizures and generalized seizures. So um, this is some of the data from um, focal seizures. And I think um, one of the things that's important to notice is that we saw um, in this trial even a, re a reduction in seizures that was pretty significant. This is all partial seizures. This is complex partial and secondary generalized seizures. And, just, and secondary generalized seizures on the bottom. And you can see that placebo is white. And as you go up in the colors, that's increasing in dose. And you can see even at the low dose of four milligrams in orange, that there was a substantial um, uh, change in seizure frequency compared to the placebo or the sugar pill in white. And um, 
for that reason, that's typically the dose that we initially will target is just the four milligrams and not go up to the very, the much higher doses of eight and 12 milligrams that were used in the initial trials. And this is a other um, data that I had um, referred to before in, in generalized um, uh, seizure disorders. And this is, I think, really exciting um, data because we don't have very many drugs that have been specifically studied um, recently in generalized epilepsy syndromes like um, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And in this study, it was shown that there was a substantial change in seizure frequency, a decrease of over 75% with um, parampanil compared to placebo in light blue. Um, and so this is a, a good option in patients with primary generalized epilepsy um, that, do, that have not responded um, to other medications, so that are drug resistant. So um, what is the best patient for parampanil or ficompa? So as I mentioned before, it is approved in both partial onset and has been shown to work in primary generalized seizures as well. And um, I mentioned this as well, but we typically will start at two milligrams and at least um, more recent data has suggested to just go up to four milligrams and see how well the patient does before going to the much higher doses. A really good benefit, uh, uh, a feature of this drug is that it has what's called a really long half-life, which means that um, it takes a long time for the drug to, to get out of your system in between doses. So for that reason, it only has to be taken once daily at bedtime. And if a patient occasionally misses um, a dose, which um, is, is a very common, it's very difficult to remember to take medications all the time, there's a little more protection um, when you're taking a long half-life uh, medication. There are some interactions with other drugs that your clinician will know about. And the most common side effects with this drug are dizziness, tiredness, and you can have irritability or aggression. So that is the side effect that really has um, limited some of the use initially of this medication because at the higher doses where, we, where initially um, we often were targeting um, uh, some more serious uh, psychiatric problems and behavioral reactions were seen. These reactions are, are relatively rare and really only seen at the, at the high doses when they're severe. So um, the lower dose, um, targeting the lower doses is, is really um, preferred by most clinicians now. So um, what about in quotes, um, the new extended release formulations of some of, of some of the older medications. So you may have heard about some of these. So there's newer or existing extended release formulations of multiple different seizure medications. Um, and uh, why, do, why, are, why is this all coming out? So um, the, one of the big reasons is that a lot of patients um, want at, uh, want once a day medication, and that helps with compliance, meaning remembering to take your medications. Um, it also can potentially help with side effects. So if you have um, an extended release formulation, that's gonna even out on this blue line instead of when you take immediate release where you're getting higher concentrations of drugs and then also lower concentrations in between your doses. So potentially your seizures will be a bit better controlled by keeping that level stable. And also you may not experience those side effects that you get um, at when the medication peaks in your blood. So um, the, the, the newest ones on the block, which aren't quite that new anymore, are extended release oxcarbazepine, which is called Oxteller. There's also two different brands of the extended release topiramate. Um, both of them may help limit um, side effects. And um, again, I mentioned it may also improve adherence or remembering to take your medications. The downside of these extended release medications is that these do not have a long half-life. It's really just how the pill is made. So um, if you do miss your medication in between doses, your level of drug can really go down substantially and that can result in breakthrough seizures. So it's very important to have very, to really remember your medicines if you're on one of these extended release drugs. So the medications with that long half-life that I mentioned before, one of them was Prampanil. We're also going to talk about one of the newer medications, Sonobamate. Those can be more forgiving because um, it has the long half-life instead of just the way the pill is made. Okay. 
So I, I be remiss to not mention um, Epidiolex or, or CBD. Um, this uh, remains one of the top questions in clinic and I'll just touch on it briefly. Um, and uh, you probably have talked to your clinician about this drug as many of my patients have with me. Um, this drug was trialed just in two um, what we call orphan or rare diseases or rare epilepsies, lenos gastro syndrome and Dravet syndrome. Um, and we don't really know how this drug works. Um, it's only approved and indicated in those two syndromes. It was it's approved by the FDA. And you can see um, here that in lenos gastro syndrome, there was a, a about 44% decrease in a type of seizures called drop attacks, although it's important to keep in mind, like in all of the other studies I showed you before, that epilepsy studies tend to have a fairly high placebo response or that sugar pill response, which really um, indicates that some patients are having improvements without any change in their treatment. So um, the real change in um, the number of seizures often will just subtract these two numbers. So in reality, maybe this is only about a 22% decrease in drop attacks. Um, this drug does have um, side effects, including tiredness or somnolence is the fancy word for that, and uh, diarrhea um, uh, as being the most common. And the, also really important is that this drug does have substantial drug interactions with some of our other common seizure medications like clobazam, which is called Onfi as well, and valproate, which um, uh, which is Depakote. Uh, in that case, we really need to uh, uh, increase the um, monitoring of liver function. So I mentioned this drug before. This is the newest drug um, in that it was only available for um, prescription earlier this month. Um, so we're just starting um, patients on this drug. It's Sonobamate or Excopri is the um, brand name. Um, and uh, it is in the, the sodium channel class, but also has other mechanisms of action. I mentioned this before, but it has a really long half-life of 50 to 60 hours. So that's how long it is that it would take for half of the medication to get out of your system if you were to not take more doses. It is metabolized through your, um, through your liver. And just to show some of this data, um, this is the first phase two study. And you can see, um, again, the placebo is, is here on the right. And the drug then was called YKP3089 before it had a name. You can see a substantial reduction in seizures um, compared to placebo, okay? Um, and um, when what was really interesting about this first study and really held true with more studies that I'll show you was the number of patients that became seizure free uh, on this drug. And this is all patients that had um, drug resistant epilepsy, frequent seizures, and had been on many seizure medications before. So you can see, and even could, with the drug. So 83% um, of patients were on two to three medications plus the study drug. You can see that over 25% of, of patients on this drug became seizure-free in the study compared to about 9% on the placebo. So that was really exciting because that's very, um, that has not been seen in a, a prior in, a, in an epilepsy drug in focal epilepsy or partial onset seizures. So there was a second phase two study um, and I'll just focus on this graph here and you can see um, that again, this is the 100% reduction in seizures, so seizure-free. That, um, that, that you saw a, a high rate of a, a, a bit over 20% of patients in the highest dose group became seizure-free. So um, that, uh, again, has really um, excited a lot of, of, of epilepsy specialists as this seems like a, a different outcome than we've seen with other drugs. So a good option in patients that have drug-resistant epilepsy and have not had a good response to previous um, drugs. Um, not surprisingly, there's more side effects at higher doses um, with this drug. The most common side effects are listed here. I know this is super busy, um, but the, the, the common things with all seizure medicines are also seen in this, like tiredness and dizziness. Um, there was a, a rare side effect of a, of a hypersensitivity, um, like drug reaction, 
um, that was seen. And that was seen only when the drug was started and titrated quickly. So um, the recommendation is to start this drug really slowly. So um, it has to be titrated up over a long time period. And so um, what we're recommending uh, right now, and this may be different, but different recommendation than you get from your doctor, is to start at this low dose of 12.5 milligrams for two weeks. And then every two weeks we go up um, slightly. And we're stopping, recommending stopping for most patients at 100 milligrams a day, and then seeing how they're doing. Important to know this drug does have drug interactions with some other drugs, and it also might lower, may lower the effectiveness of birth control pills. Um, so those are all things that, that, you, that your doctor should be aware of. So um, where does that uh, leave us? So there's many, all these new medications I talked to you about can be really valuable tools um, there are some that I pointed out have new mechanisms of action, so they might work better for certain types of epilepsy. Um, some, some medications may limit side effects compared to their like older counterpart drugs. And uh, there's medications that might make things more tolerable and extend release formulations. And then the last one I talked about, Sonova may, may actually improve our seizure freedom rates, um, which um, obviously is, is one of our major goals. So what a, what's coming soon? And the last one here are the rescue medication options. Some of these are available now, but some are not. So I put them in this category. And I'm just gonna touch really briefly on these. Um, I think there's two um, medications, benfluorinine and everolimus, which um, really represent a new era of potential targeted therapy where they both seem to be particularly effective in um, specific rare genetic disorders, everolimus in, um, uh, in tuber sclerosis complex, and, also, and fenfluramine and Dravet syndrome. And so really pointing to maybe um, to, to genetic testing having a role potentially as we go to the future in picking the right seizure medication for a patient. Pad7 is a, a newer medication as well. It's um, interesting in that it combines two different um, uh, actions, um, and the initial study was uh, quite positive and um, right now is enrolling in a clinical trial. So that's a, a drug that we are quite positive about. Uh, natalizumab is um, a, a different type of approach. Um, it's a drug that has been used in uh, another neurologic disorder, multiple sclerosis. Um, and it's a monthly infusion, actually, of, uh, that um, would then potentially avoid daily medication and some of the typical seizure medication side effects. And um, so that it's right now enrolling in the first large human study in epilepsy. And then new rescue medication options. So in red here, I highlighted the ones that are available. Um, uh, and I, I should say that this is one of the recommendations right now in the time of COVID um, that the Epilepsy Foundation has made is that, um, that, that epilepsy patients do have a rescue plan, um, which was mentioned in the earlier talk. Um, but um, having some medication plan, if you were to have a seizure at home, to try to avoid um, having to go to the hospital or to the emergency department. Um, so the uh, diastat has, is a, is a, a rescue medication. I should also say all of these are what's called benzodiazepines which are um, medications that, um, that you may have, if you or your loved one may have been given in the emergency room setting, if you have a breakthrough seizure, it's very effective in decreasing the risk of additional seizures on the same day or stopping a seizure, um, but does cause, across, across all these medicines, can cause um, tiredness. And if, if, if given too high a dose, um, may need uh, medical um, attention. Um, so, the diastat is given as a rectal gel. It starts working in 10 to 15 minutes. That's been available quite some time. Um, for a lot of reasons, we prefer to have another option besides a, a medicine that's given um, rectally. And so two medications that's, that have become available in the last few months are both given as nasal sprays. Um, they're really um, quite comparable. Um, one is a medication called midazolam and one is diazepam. They're both in the same class of of benzodiazepines, um, and they're both approved for cluster seizures. So if a, a patient has had a history of their seizures occurring more than um, one in a, in a day, um, uh, that's when I've been 
successfully able to get this approved for patients. There are several other, and I'm probably not listing all of them, um, rescue options that are under um, study. I think several of these are quite um, exciting to me in that their onset of action is quite quick. So this, uh, the Xenio, which is a needle-free auto-injector, um, so um, uh, that can be given by a caregiver or the patient themselves, but the onset is quite rapid, so potentially could even stop a seizure um, while it's still going on. And same with this inhaled um, um, option staccato. Um, and so these are, these are options that I, I think will be um, really exciting and hopefully um, become available, approved and available in the fairly near future. So um, transitioning off of talking about medications, but um, wanted to uh, mention some, you know, what are some of the unmet needs? And I, one of the, the biggest one is anti-epileptogenesis. And that means um, not the seizure, not just seizure drugs, which where we're, we're trying to prevent the seizure from occurring, but actually how can we address um, the underlying abnormalities in the brain so seizures never occur um, and we can stop the development of seizures after um, something that we know might increase the risk of seizures, like a traumatic brain injury or a stroke. Um, so uh, that's a, a something in the field that um, hopefully we'll be able to dig into and have information um, to provide to uh, patients and caregivers um, regarding in the future. So I, I told you also I would talk a bit about some of the new um, devices and uh, surgical treatments for epilepsy. And although I talked about many new drug options, um, the, the chances of seizure freedom with additional drug trials, as I showed earlier, is quite low. Um, and in patients that are um, determined at, at an epilepsy center to be a good candidate for an epilepsy surgery that could potentially cure their seizures or stop them from um, ha having seizures in the future. They may still need to stay on seizure medications, but um, to, to, um, to change the networks in their brain so that seizures cannot occur or do not occur anymore, that is, is the first line treatment um, uh, for patients that have drug resistant epilepsy and have an evaluation that indicates they're a good uh, candidate for that. Unfortunately, in the United States, um, there's a tremendous treatment gap um, from patients uh, being determined to have drug-resistant epilepsy um, and then getting to an epilepsy evaluation. And unfortunately, it's about 20 years. Um, uh, so uh, if you or a loved one do fit into the category of drug-resistant epilepsy, it is recommended by the American Academy of Neurology that um, patients that are, are continuing to have seizures despite having tried and two or three seizure medicines should be seen at an epilepsy center, um, like the Penn Epilepsy Center or like Jefferson um, uh, that was mentioned earlier, uh, and um, see, if that, see if that patient is a good candidate for um, a potential curative surgery or an epilepsy device. So I won't go through this in detail, but a pre-surgical evaluation involves a lot of different tests and essentially the, the cl expert clinicians in the epilepsy centers work with lots of other um, specialists in neurosurgery, in neuroradiology, in neuropsychology, and um, determine whether a patient is a good candidate for a surgical intervention. In the best surgical candidates, um, uh, that can result in seizure freedom. And this is a, a famous study um, by Sam Weeb. Um, where they, they looked at patients in Canada who had continued treatment with seizure medications or had surgery and showed that um, a substantial difference in seizure freedom rates, almost 60%, comparing surgical intervention versus continued treatment with seizure medications. So what's new in, um, surg in, in surgical intervention? Um, one of the... the, the um, Biggest changes is increasing use of laser ablation instead of, um, instead of temporal lobectomies or other types of surgical resections. And so this is just an example of what laser ablation is. It's performed by the neurosurgeon um, at, an at an epilepsy center um, in an MRI scanner. 
and they can target the area of the brain where the seizures are coming from, uh, from and put a, um, a small um, wire in uh, through a small hole in uh, the skull and uh, burn that area. And patients actually um, uh, uh, most frequently go home the next day. Um, uh, uh, feel, there's a very short recovery period for the majority of patients, and we're seeing really good um, seizure outcomes in the appropriately chosen patient for this um, intervention. So um, that's a, a intervention that we're doing increasingly more of, and uh, it's much um, less invasive than the previous surgical um, interventions. And then um, what about different uh, devices in epilepsy? And um, this is a really complicated slide, but there are now three um, devices that are approved and used in epilepsy. The newest one um, that was approved is deep brain stimulation, which is the one all the way to green. And I won't go through um, all of this slide in great detail. I'll just focus on the end part here, the seizure-free period. So all of these devices are considered palliative, meaning that um, uh, we do not uh, predict that it will make someone seizure-free in the long term, but um, patients do uh, frequently have periods of at least six months where they are seizure-free with these devices. And you can see um, with RNS, some of the recent data, it's up to, it's over a quarter of patients will um, have a, at least a six month period of seizure freedom. And then the data in terms of median seizure reduction is shown here at the bottom, where with the vagal nerve stimulator, it's about 40% at three years at, um, and both for the RNS, NeuroPace RNS system and the deep brain stimulator system, seeing about a 75% re medium reduction of, of seizures in the long term. So um, what are these devices exactly? This is a, a picture of the NeuroPace RNS system. Um, and um, this device is actually targeted at the area of the brain where the seizures are coming from and works sort of like a defibrillator does for the heart in that it's detecting the brain rhythms continuously and your um, physician can, um, can program it to stimulate the brain when it sees um, bad rhythms that might come before a seizure. So you can see, um, this is just some pictures of how that works. So the doctor will um, note kind of what activity we want to detect and stimulate and then can change the settings. And, and then um, the last part here is showing the device detecting a bad rhythm, stimulating, and it looks like it stopped that from turning into a seizure. Um, who is the, R, who, what is the best patient um, for an RS, RNS system? This is a really complicated decision that really um, needs to be discussed in detail with your epilepsy treatment team. Um, uh, but the, the indications are in adults, although there are some centers that are implanting this device in pediatric population. Um, and it's indicated in patients that have one or two areas of the brain where the seizures come from. Um, and uh, also can be used in areas of the brain where we can't do a laser ablation or remove because um, of the important function in that area. For instance, if it's a speech or language area, we would not be able to resect that. So um, important to know that the battery life has been improved in recent versions, but um, battery, uh, batteries in all these devices do need to be replaced. So um, I mentioned this earlier, but I think it's also really important to point out again um, the, lo the long-term seizure reduction is, is, it gets to be quite high. And this is the same across, interestingly, all three of the devices, um, that they work better with time. And um, we think that's because it's changing the way your, the, the, the brain is connected to, uh, to the area that is seizing. Um, and we call that modulating or changing brain networks. Um, so you can see um, here that as time goes on at year nine, that you're getting increasing amounts of seizure reduction um, up to um, in the 70% range. So what about the vagal nerve stimulator, um, the V or VNS? This is an older device, but I, I think it's important to mention it here so that you can compare the devices against one another. Um, 
this device um, in comparison to the other two devices is used both in focal epilepsy and generalized epilepsy and very commonly in um, what we sometimes call symptomatic generalized epilepsies like lenis gastaut syndrome. Um, and I mentioned before um, the responder rates uh, vary by study, but I, I usually um, state that about half of patients will have at least a 50% reduction in seizures. Most common side effects are hoarseness, shortness of breath, and you can get acid reflux. And there is a newer device that will trigger when the heart rate goes up or with tachycardia. And we know that um, it's very common for the heart rate to go up with seizures. Similar to this, the, the slide I showed you earlier for the Neuropace system, this does work better over time. And you can see the mean seizure reduction as time goes on improves. And then the newest um, device that's been approved is, the, um, is deep brain stimulation. And this is stimulation of the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. It, it was a, a trial called the Sante trial, this stimulus of the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and epilepsy um, trial. So it was approved um, about two years ago, um, but there was, uh, it takes some time to get it actually into practice. So it's been in practice a shorter time period than that. Um, and I showed you some of the data on how well it works before. Um, uh, there is some data that temporal lobe and frontal lobe epilepsy may respond best. And that's because that anterior nucleus of the thalamus is part of what we call the pate circuit, which is really highly involved in areas in the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe. Um, at some of the, in the study with some of the settings, there were, ad, there were side effects with mood and memory. Um, uh, but um, with uh, changes in some of the um, stimulation settings, that can that has um, improved. And so again, similar to the other two devices, you see improvement with time. You see here when you get out to the seven-year mark that you're getting um, about a seventy-plus uh, percent um, uh, response rate. So how, how do we select between these um, different options? And this is a really complicated decision that definitely should discuss in depth with your physician team. And um, at major epilepsy centers that are doing these types of surgeries, um, they have, will all have a multidisciplinary, meaning um, experts from lots of different fields, conference um, where um, complicated epilepsy patients where we're considering a device will be discussed in depth with all of the different experts from neurosurgery, from epilepsy, from neuropsychology, and from neuroradiology. Um, so uh, this is a complicated decision that, um, that experts will think a lot about before discussing it, um, the options that may be best for you. But this is just a high level view of some of the pluses and minuses. I think I'll point out just a few things. Um, one is that the vagal nerve stimulator, although the, eff the efficacy data or how well it works isn't as positive um, as the other two devices, it is much less invasive. This is not a brain surgery and it's does it done as an outpatient. So it doesn't require hospitalization. Both the RNS and the DBS devices are more invasive. Um, the RNS device is, is probably the most invasive in that you need to remove part of the skull to put that device in. Um, but they both require um, at least one night in the hospital. Um, I think um, coming back to the first talk, what's really important to note is that all of these devices have been shown in studies to decrease the risk of sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. And you can see the, and the, the expected or anticipated SUDEP rate in medically intractable epilepsy um, and then in patients that are candidates for epilepsy surgery. And you can see, unfortunately, in patients that are candidates for epilepsy surgery, um, ha they have the highest um, risk of SUDEP and that's most likely because their epilepsy is the least well controlled, which is something that it was pointed out in the previous talk. And you can see across all of the different stimulation options or the brain um, devices for epilepsy, that the risk of SUDEP 
is lower. And these are all based upon fairly small numbers of patients. Um, so I would not focus on thinking that one of these devices that is better than the other device for preventing SUDEP, but more that all of the devices do decrease this risk to some um, degree. And so that's another reason to consider um, one of the FLC devices in a patient who's not a candidate for a potentially curative epilepsy surgery. So to wrap things up, um, there are multiple new drug treatment options in epilepsy. Um, there are the daily preventative or the medicines you take all the time, and then also those rescue options that I discussed. And I do wanna stress um, uh, that, especially with the time of COVID, make sure that you have a rescue plan um, at home. Um, it's also recommended that you, um, if possible, have three months supply or refills on your seizure medications instead, the, instead of the one month refill option if that's allowed through your insurance. So those are two things that we're really trying to do for all of our patients. Um, there, are, there are several new surgical and device options that certainly should be considered. And as I mentioned before, in patients with drug-resistant epilepsy, if they're, if, if they're continuing to have seizures, it is a recommendation that they uh, be evaluated at an epilepsy center at least once every two years. And of course, there's a significant need to continue research. You heard that in the first talk regarding SUDEP. I would definitely wanna leave some time for questions, but before doing so, I just wanna thank, uh, give a big shout out to, um, to the whole Penn Epilepsy Center team. Um, I mentioned before, it is multidisciplinary, meaning we have lots of different specialists involved. From, the, from neuroradiology, neuropsychology, et cetera. We also have a fantastic social worker and nursing team and administrative support team. And this is just some pictures of our provider team, um, uh, including our two fantastic nurse practitioners. Um, perhaps several of you on this uh, call know some of the people on this slide, but I'm uh, very fortunate to work with them and hopefully can see them again in person pretty soon. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll, um, I'll open up for questions. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, we, I have two questions here that are sort of, um, sort of generic to um, seizures in sure. general and epilepsy in general. Um, one second. Uh, the first one is, my mom saw me in bed a few years ago with blue lips. What types of seizures are common with that? Um, so that, I think that's a good question. It's, it is, it's hard to know without a lot of, uh, of, of more information, but it is more common to have blue lips, which can be seen if you're not getting enough oxygen during a generalized convulsive seizures or generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Um, and so um, that was something that was touched on in the first talk. Um, and uh, and if as particularly at nighttime, if you're having uncontrolled generalized tonic-clonic seizures, that does increase the risk of SUDAP. Um, and it and the you know that some of the interventions, particularly improved seizure control, can help decrease that risk, as was discussed in the first talk. Okay, great, thank you. The next question is, can you grow out of seizures? Um, also a good question. Um, it, you can grow out of certain types of, of, of epilepsy. Um, and, uh, that, and sometimes uh, your physician will do testing like EEGs to help determine whether you may have grown out of your seizures. Um, and you know, the, it very much depends on the cause of the seizures, what your brain MRI has shown, what your, your EEG has shown, potentially what genetic testing has shown. Okay. And then the next question is a little bit more specific um, and it's in regards to um, Epidiolex. So a patient with a heart transplant was told by her cardiologist that Epidiolex would not be good for her because it would affect her heart. Is this possible? Mm. It's hard to know without knowing what medications um, this individual was on because as I mentioned, Epidiolex does have some drug interactions. Um, uh, but I, you know, I, I'm not aware of any specific reason that Epidiolex would not be 
um, okay if that was the only medical history. But um, but I'm sure this patient probably has a very complicated medical history, and there may be a reason for that. But um, talking to the neurologist might be, or having the neurologist and cardiologist talk about it might be um, the best thing to do. Okay. And then one other thing is regarding, um, is there something called the Depakote pump that's being tried right now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, okay. <laughs> that's that, yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, things out there on the horizon that I couldn't touch on because there's, there's so much going on in epilepsy research, right. but there is a, a study um, in um, Australia that is uh, putting, infusing or putting um, Depakote into the cerebral spinal fluid, um, which is the fluid that surrounds your brain and your spinal cord. So they're putting in a chronic um, kind of uh, catheter or connection, and then the drug is just pumped in through to that fluid that surrounds your brain. Um, and I think that only a handful of patients have been implanted with this device and it's not available. The study is not ongoing in the United States, but it's a interesting, definitely a novel approach or a new, new approach. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay, great. I think that's all our questions right now. So we will leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I apologize. My slides had a didn't work so well. Hopefully, everyone could see and um, yeah, and stay. We can know, stay, see everything. Okay, excellent. Okay, and I know it was a lot to cover. So hopefully, um, everyone uh, was able to to follow along somewhat. But I um, hope everyone stays well. Um, thank you so much. You too. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Have a good Take night. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. You too. Okay, so let's look where we are. I'd just like to thank everyone. Um, we used the chat button and submitted the questions. If you would think of any questions after this, I would encourage you to just email those to me and I will um, get some answers uh, or get those questions passed along to our speakers tonight and then get those answers back up um, to you. So if I could just ask now for your, um, for your participation in filling out the poll that I just launched. Uh, this is the second and final poll of the evening. And if you could just go in and just take a minute to do that. Uh, and we just wanna, the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania just wants to take a minute to thank you again for taking the time to uh, show up on this beautiful night. We know it's so nice out and it's, it's, we're very appreciative that you took the time to show up tonight. So um, please stay healthy, stay safe, um, the poll will remain for you to um, fill out and um, have a good evening. Please let us know if you need anything. Take care.